So a few weeks ago, on my day off, I got a call on my cell phone from LA. I didn't recognize the number. And I usually don't answer those calls, but for some reason I did. So it's like, hello, this is Rachel. Is this Rachel, the pastor of First Congregational Church of Berkeley? Yes. How, what can I do for you? How can I help you? Well, my name is Henry, and I'm calling from some church in L.A. that I didn't recognize the name of. And, and I, I have a question. Okay. Do you, at your church, you, do you preach the gospel? Do you, do you preach the Bible? And I, I'm sorry? And he says, well, I want, you know, I, I want to know, do you, you, do, you preach the, do you preach the Bible? Do you preach the gospel at your church? And I said, well... Yeah, we try hard to preach the gospel at our church and even sometimes in a sermon. <laughs> but, we, you know, we do our best. I'm thinking, where is this going? And he says, well, well, I want to know how it is that you can say that you preach the gospel, that you, that you follow the Bible, and preach what you do about family, about family values and marriage. And so at this point, there's like, millions of different thoughts going on in my head in very rapid succession. Like, who is this person and how did they get my phone number? Is it really, are they, is it, I'm racking my brain for when was the last time I took on family values in a sermon? You know, it's like, are they talking about me personally or was it Kit or Phil or Molly? Can I blame it on them? Are they, (laughs) are they talking about the UCC in general? And, you know, I was, or I'm like, should I, should I hang up? Is this going to be an anti-gay call? So I must have taken a while to respond because he says, hello? And I, and I say, hello, and he's like, well, I just, I'm just wondering, I'm, I'm wondering how it is that you can preach the gospel and preach what you do about family. And, and because isn't, doesn't, doesn't the Bible say that the most important thing to God is fidelity? And the way that we show our fidelity to God is through fidelity in our family relationships and biblical, living up to biblical, traditional family values. So something in me decided that he wasn't trying to be a jerk, that he was actually asking, and he was asking me about the good news. He was asking me if I had good news to share about the biblical view of family. And I thought, yeah, I think I have some good news to share. And so we began to talk. So I started by saying, I agree with you that fidelity is a huge theme in the Bible and for God. Fidelity, God's faithfulness to us, despite and regardless of our many ways that we are unable to remain faithful to God. And I would agree that the Bible uses the family and family images and family stories to talk about the messages that that those writers were trying to, the points those writers were trying to make. But I don't think we can talk about normative biblical family values. Or at least if we're talking about the the values that the Bible holds up, I don't think that they're ones that you, my friend Henry, might want us to emulate. Let's start with Abraham and Sarah. So Abraham and Sarah couldn't have a baby, and so Sarah um, tells Abraham to have sex with his slave girl, Hagar. Hagar gets pregnant, has uh, Ishmael. Um, and then, and they raise Ishmael as, as their own. They take Ishmael as their own until Abraham and Sarah have a baby of their own, Isaac. And then Sarah gets worried that Isaac, that Ishmael will take Isaac's inheritance. And so she casts out, she has Abraham cast out um, Ishmael and Hagar into the wilderness. Or we could look at Jacob, the patriarch Jacob, who um, tricks his twin brother Esau out of his birthright. And then later in cahoots with his mother, uh, Rebecca, tricks their father into giving the blessing that rightfully would go to Esau, to him, to Jacob. Or maybe we could look at King David, who has multiple wives, at least seven, that are named in um, the Hebrew Bible. And one of those, Bathsheba, he committed adultery with. And when Bathsheba got pregnant, David tried to um, arrange that so it could look like it was Uriah, her husband's baby. But when that didn't work, David had her, Uriah, who was his most faithful military person, he had Uriah killed on the battlefield. So Henry, my friend on the phone, says, well, okay, but, but Jesus, 
Let's look at Jesus, because Jesus, Jesus cared about the family. Jesus says, you know, he's talking about marriage with the Pharisees, and he says, what God has drawn together, the Pharisees are asking Jesus about divorce, and Jesus says, what God has drawn together, let no one put asunder. This is what Henry says to me, and I said, great, yeah, let's talk about Jesus. Jesus who says, I have not come to bring peace, but discord. I have come to set a man against his father, a woman against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, unless someone hates their own family, they can't enter, be my disciple and enter the kingdom of God. Jesus who, when he's teaching in a crowd and his mom and his brother come in to try to see, to see him and the, the people around him say, hey, your family's outside, he says, who are my family? They're not my family, you all who do the, the work of God, you are my family. And then today, in today's scripture, Someone says, I want to follow you, Jesus, but let me go and bury my father, which was central to the Torah commandment of honoring your father and mother. And Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead. Now, I wasn't trying in this conversation, I wasn't trying to proof text, which is when you choose different Bible passages in order to make your particular point. Not only is that super annoying... It's also really poor biblical exegesis because the Bible is so contradictory you can probably find anything, any quote, to justify any position that you want. So I wasn't trying to do that, nor was I trying to suggest that Jesus was anti-family because clearly I don't think that's true either. The, the scripture text that my friend had quoted to me is evidence. And also Jesus, he um, arguably some of his best friends were an intact family unit. Mary, Martha, Lazarus, he loved them. And then John's gospel has at the very end of his life, when Jesus is dying on the cross, he looks out and he sees his mother, the same mother that he was disregarding. He sees his mother and he sees his beloved disciple and he knows he's about to die and he looks at his mother and he says, mother, behold your son. And he says to his friend, the disciple, brother, behold your mother. And the text says that that hour, that disciple took Jesus' mother home into his home. I don't think Jesus was, was anti-family. And so, and so what, what is Jesus trying to say in those texts? Because there are those words where Jesus is like, let the dead bury your own dead. I think Jesus was trying to do what he always did. He looked at the pillars of society, the way society was structured, the conventional wisdom, and he pointed out the way it wasn't working. Jesus' response to family is, as we've been saying all summer, complicated. And partly it's complicated because our understanding of family and our time and place is so different than what family meant for Mediterranean in antiquity. During first century Palestine, the family was the central economic organizing unit of society. Everything came from your family. Your financial security, your religious identity, your social networks, everything was about your family. Your whole protection mechanism, your survival depended on your family unit, who you were blood related to and marriage contracts. A loss of family would be the most significant loss you could imagine. It was literally a matter of life and death. So then what is Jesus saying? Was Jesus unconcerned about people's security? Of course not. I think he was challenging what it was that people were, were holding on to for society, like he did with religion and politics. The family was supposed to be a center of protection and identity, but it was not that. Anyone who was marginalized in any way if you interacted with anyone who was impure, if you took part in inappropriate social relations, you were cast out and marginalized. And who knows what would happen to you, you could die. And so for the people who weren't elite, they, they didn't have that protection of family, but it wasn't just for those. Even if you were secure in your family, that sort of social control created a sense of anxiety. It created a, a you know, who's my clan versus who are the other people around. And Jesus said, that doesn't work, that's not, he, he wasn't trying to dismantle family, he was trying to create a different kind, one based on different values, values of compassion, mercy, generosity. And so, he chose his own, his family. Landless fishermen, 
rich but despised tax collectors, women, children. And they weren't just followers. We can tell that Jesus considered them family because what did he do with them most of all? He ate. He had table fellowship with them. Over and over and over again, we hear these stories of Jesus gathering these people together and eating with them, which in that culture was the primary way of communicating who is your kin, who is your family. And that table kept getting expanded and expanded and expanded. So I was saying all this to my friend, probably not all of this, I think our conversation ended before I got this far with Henry. But I've thought about him, and I haven't heard from him since, since then. I've thought about him a lot since then, and I've prayed for him. And the same prayer I pray for us, that he will have family like that. That we will have family like that. Because that kind of family that Jesus was creating was not, I don't think, incidental to the ministry that he was preparing them to do. It was foundational. To be able to be, to show up fully for who you are in your brokenness, with your marginality, however it is, and to be seen and welcomed and loved, invited, that's foundational. That is the fertile soil that allows that seed of who we are to grow into who we are being called to be, to grow. In our text this morning, it's, it says that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And in the Gospel of Luke, where this text comes from, that's a long journey. It's like 18 chapters. But I think it's significant that on the beginning, he was going to Jerusalem to face the cross. It's significant that Jesus is having these kind of harsh exchanges with people about leaving their families to come and be part of a new one. Because he knew that in order to sustain that ministry, in order to create the kingdom of God, you got to be with people who see you fully for who you are. you got to be with people who, who love you in your brokenness into wholeness. you got to have that security in order to create the type of society that Jesus was asking for and wanting and the vision that he had. So I pray for that for Henry. I pray for that for us, that we all have those families, that we can be that family with each other, and that we create that family out in the world. Because that's the other thing Jesus did. That table kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. He sent his disciples out to continue to do that work. And we can make that family. We can be that family. We can choose to be and create that family in the world. Because God chose us. God chose and chooses every single one of you to be part of God's family. Every single one of us. No matter how queer, how odd, how marginal, how wonderful, how mainstream, how broken we feel, God chooses us to be God's family. Let's take that in and then take that out and create that for the world. May it be so. Amen.